Well, up next, we have a real treat. I'm absolutely delighted to, to welcome uh, our opening lecturer, our guest speaker, Professor Elaine Sadler. And I won't give too long an introduction because we want to hear about your science, but Professor Elaine Sadler is an astrophysicist and her research covers a wide range of topic, topics in extragalactic astronomy from galax galaxy evolution to black holes and the enigmatic fast radio bursts. She's also chief scientist at CSIRO's Australia National Telescope Facility, where she's been helping to bring a revolutionary new telescope, you might have heard of it, the ASKAP, into operation. She's also involved in settling, setting the research direction for the next generation SKA radio telescope, which is a really ambitious global project. And we might even hear a little bit more about that. So um, I will uh, now pass over to you, Professor Elaine Sadler. Thank you so much. So thank you, Alice. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. So it's a real pleasure to be here and to have a chance to talk to you about things that are happening in radio astronomy, looking forward to the future and indeed, as Alice said, to the SKA. So I'm going to talk a little bit also about the telescope that you see on the left here, ASCAP. And let me see if I can advance the slides. Ah. Perhaps this is what I should use. There we are. So I would also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land here at the University of Sydney, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, pay respects to their leaders past and present. I also pay respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of all the lands on which the participants are joining us. And I mention also the Wadjuri Yamaji people who are the traditional owners of the land around the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, where I will be uh, focusing my talk today. So just to give an outline, I'm going to give a little bit of background first, just to get everybody on the same page as to what we're talking about with stars, galaxies and black holes. Uh, then I want to talk about some of the most recent results from the ASCAP radio telescope in Western Australia, and then look forward towards the SKA, which is a global mega science facility for the 2030s. And for the students online, uh, those of you who decide to pursue an interest in astronomy will not most likely have the chance to use this telescope. Uh, and there's a theme here, which is really that in this area of science, as in many others, advances in science are enabled by new instruments and new technology. And so I want to give you a sense of the new technology that's allowed us to look deeper into the universe than ever before and to discover new, new things. The focus of my talk is actually going to be on what's called the baryonic universe. And those of you who've kept up with progress in astrophysics will know that something like 90% of the universe is made up of stuff that we, we actually don't really know what it is. So. The energy content of the universe at this particular epoch in cosmic time, about 69% is dark energy. That's um, something that fills the void between galaxies and actually accelerates the expansion of the universe. The discovery of dark energy was the uh, basis of the award of the 2011 Nobel Prize to Brian Schmidt and colleagues. 26% is dark matter. That is um, matter that obeys the law of gravity but doesn't radiate. That's tends to lurk in the outer parts of galaxies. 5% is what we call normal matter or baryons. And that's stuff like atoms, molecules, planets, stars, uh, and us. So even though this is only 5% of the content of the universe, it's in many ways the most interesting and perhaps even the most enigmatic 5% because there's a, a lot of things there that we still need to understand. So we live in a universe that's full of galaxies. Uh, and what I'm showing here on the left is just a, a cartoon of the Big Bang on the left, 13.7 billion years ago, which is the start of the observable universe as we know it. The universe at that very early epoch was extremely hot and dense, uh, so dense, in fact, that photons couldn't escape for almost 400,000 years. Then we see uh, the surface of last scattering, the cosmic microwave background. Uh, followed by a period when the universe cooled and essentially was dark and opaque. And then about 400 million years ago, the formation of the first stars that lit up the universe uh, for the first time. What we see on the right is an image of a tiny patch of sky 
with the Hubble Space Telescope. This is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Uh, and this is about 1% of the area of the full moon. So it's a tiny, tiny patch of sky. But what you see there is just a multitude of galaxies as far as we can see. So the universe is absolutely full of galaxies. So if we want to understand about galaxies and how they change over time, we start with stars. That's one of the constituents of a galaxy. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can find out in, in elementary astronomy textbooks, but I think the great astrophysical achievement of the 20th century was actually to understand the life history of stars. Uh, these are, of course, self-gravitating blobs of gas. They get the energy by nuclear fusion. And it turns out that if you know the mass of a star at the time of its birth, you can predict mathematically almost everything that's going to happen to it after that. Um, the most interesting and perhaps less known uh, stages are the birth of stars, which we still don't understand fully, and the end products of what happens to a star at the end of its life, when it can explode as a supernova or it can collapse into a, a neutron star or black hole. And these compact objects are also of great interest astrophysically. So if we could step outside our own Milky Way galaxy and look at it from above, we would see something rather like the picture you see on the screen there. Um, concentration of yellow stars in the middle and then these rich spiral arms of dust and, and gas. So what we see here is a galaxy of gas, dust, stars, dark matter. And this is something like a cosmic ecosystem. The interplay and the feedback between these different components is quite complex. So there's not a simple diagram that we can use as we do for stars and predict what's going to happen in the life of a galaxy. We really have to deduce what happens to these galaxies by looking at what we observe and then working from there. The other thing about galaxies like our own Milky Way is they're not evolving in isolation. You might think, well, the distances from one galaxy to another is huge. They can't have uh, much to do with each other. But as you see in the bottom right there, uh, galaxies tend to clump in groups uh, and they can undergo collisions and even mergers. So a galaxy like our Milky Way has probably swallowed up a dozen small galaxies over its lifetime and grown in that way. Gas can also fall in uh, from interstellar space. So it's not at all a closed loop system. There are many different ways that a galaxy can exchange material with its surroundings. So one of the key questions that influences the design of many of the next generation telescopes, the James Webb Space Telescope, the large ground based optical telescopes that are being built now, the square kilometer array, are all looking at how do galaxies change and evolve over cosmic time? What did they look like in the beginning? And how do you get to a galaxy like our own Milky Way to be where it is today? Um, and so that's one of the key questions I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, in this talk. The other way that I guess astrophysicists try to understand the universe, particularly from the perspective of cosmology, uh, is to use large computer simulations. These have now become enormous and very sophisticated. You essentially create a model universe inside a supercomputer. And so what you see in the big color picture here is uh, a still from the illustrious collaboration. This is a, a group in Europe who build model universes in supercomputers of increasing complexity. Uh, if you go to their web page, you can find videos that actually show the, the growth of structure over cosmic time. What we're looking at here, the blue sort of lacy structure is actually the distribution of dark matter. And they start off in the beginning with this being a uniform distribution. And then these little gravitational instabilities grow over time to produce a structure that looks like what's called the cosmic web. It looks like a kind of honeycomb structure in dark matter. And if you look at the distribution of galaxies in the nearby universe, which is the plot that you see uh, just on the right there in, in blue dots, that the idea is that these galaxies trace peaks in the cosmic distribution of dark matter. And it turns out that the match between the model universe and the galaxies that we observe in terms of dark matter distribution is extremely good. This is so accurate now, it's referred to as precision cosmology. So the simulations are very good at producing the observed structure of galaxies, even though we don't know what dark matter is, we know that it obeys the laws of gravity. 
things become much more complicated when you talk about the baryonic content of the galaxies themselves, when you don't look at a galaxy as just a point mass that moves under gravity, but say, well, this is actually an ensemble of stars that are forming gas that's moving around and so on. That's actually very hard to incorporate into the simulations and still has not been done completely successfully because the physics there is much more complex than simply particles that move under gravity. So incorporating gas and stars into these simulations is, is very challenging, computationally expensive, and very important to be guided by what we can actually observe by galaxies at different epochs of cosmic time. And one of the great things, I guess, about the fact that the speed of light is finite is that the telescope works as a time machine. So we can actually, the further away a galaxy is, the larger the time that its light takes to reach us. So if we have a galaxy that uh, is 10 billion light years away, it, it's going to take, you know, we will see it as it looked 10 billion years in the past. So most astrophysical objects emit over the whole electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. There are observatories in gamma rays, X-rays, and so on. Most of these parts of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum don't pass through the Earth's atmosphere. They're blocked by uh, the atmosphere of the Earth or by the, the radiation belts of the Earth. So it's really only the visible and the radio that pass through the Earth's surface where we can build large telescopes to study uh, the universe at these wavelengths. At other wavelengths, these are done by satellites. And in the case of an optical telescope like the Hubble Space Telescope, the reason for putting that outside the Earth into orbit is really just to avoid the distortions of the Earth's atmosphere. But for radio telescopes, those distortions don't occur. Uh, and so we can build large radio telescopes on the ground that work uh, pretty much as well as they would anywhere else. So the focus of the rest of my talk will really be on what we learn about galaxies by looking in the radio part of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. And what we're seeing here is a composite picture. So um, the black background with the galaxies, that's an image from the Hubble Space Telescope focused on a rather ordinary looking galaxy uh, in the middle of the picture. What we see when we take an image with a radio telescope is all this extra stuff in pink here, which is huge. It's going um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of light years out into space. And so what we've got here is a galaxy, and then we've got radio emitting plasma that's coming out from the center of that galaxy and traveling enormous distances into space. And all this is powered, we're barely sure, by accretion of material onto a supermassive black hole in the center of that galaxy. So what we're seeing here is really black hole powered energy that can accelerate uh, electrons and particles to near relativistic speeds and transports energy to enormous distances out of the galaxy. Uh, and these are phenomena that we had no idea existed until the first radio telescopes were built. So making these kinds of radio images of the sky is one way of studying a facet of the universe we can't study in other ways. And there's a second aspect as well, which I'll come to, which is that radio telescopes also give us a unique view of the kind of cold gas that can form new generations of stars, which again, we wouldn't see with an optical telescope. So what we think is going on here, right in the central part of the galaxy, and this is, this is a region maybe the same size as our solar system, tiny region there, there's a black hole. Uh, we call it supermassive. It's anywhere from a few million to a few billion times the mass of the sun. So an enormously massive black hole. The process by which that got there is quite interesting. But what's clear is that the bigger the galaxy in general, the bigger the black hole at the center. So there's a co-evolution, almost a symbiosis between the galaxy and its central black hole. So three ingredients here, there's the black hole at the center. There's what we call an accretion disk, which is material, most likely gas that's spiraling around the black hole. Um, some of that will actually fall in. Uh, some of it will actually release energy before it falls in. And then we've got a strong magnetic field. And what we're seeing is then the acceleration of these particles collimated very finely by the magnetic field. And you'll see that this jet stays straight out for a long way. And then at some point, the magnetic field dies down and the electrons escape and make these, these fuzzy radio lobes. 
So why do we talk about a revolution in radio astronomy? And really the reason is that over the last decade, we've seen major new telescopes with exciting new capabilities built all around the world. These are essentially pathfinder telescopes for the SKA, the Square Kilometer Array. So we see here on the top left in China, the FAST telescope, that's a 500 meter diameter dish. That's a single, single enormous telescope there. The other telescopes are all arrays, interferometer arrays. So we see ASCAP in the middle uh, and MWA below it. Those are the two Australian Pathfinder telescopes, Meerkat in South Africa, LOFAR in the Netherlands, the CHIME telescope in Canada. So great diversity of technologies. You can see that some of these telescopes look very different. What they have in common is they're exploring ways to build bigger and more powerful telescopes more cheaply. Uh, and what's interesting also is that these telescopes are not just in five different countries, but on five different continents. So this is really a worldwide effort to make advances in technology and to use this new technology to learn something new about our universe. SKA, the Square Kilometer Array, this is a global mega science project to build a telescope of sensitivity tens to hundreds of times larger than we have now that will allow us to see deeper into the universe. It's such a big project that all the countries in the world almost that do radio astronomy have got together and I'll show you some of the countries involved later on. Uh, there are two parts, there's a low frequency part on the left, high frequency part on the right, and this low frequency part of the array is situated in Australia, the high frequency part in southern Africa. Uh, and this brings me to a, a small rem reminiscence about Professor Harry Messel, and I had the opportunity to meet and talk with Harry many times. He loved the SKA project. Harry Messel was no stranger to people who wanted to do ambitious things, uh, and he loved the fact that this was so ambitious. Uh, and whenever I would meet him in the last years of his life, he'd always say to me, how is it going with the SKA? And then he would point to me and say, you have to make sure this gets built. So it's a real pleasure to, to be here with some of Harry's family and to report back that this indeed now is in the process of being built. So just a quick digression on radio interferometers. Uh, this is a way of electronically connecting an array of radio telescopes to work in the same way as one big telescope, the size of, of the array itself. So you can produce an image with incredibly high angular resolution if you put your telescopes far enough apart. And these baselines can be as large as the diameter of the Earth, or even if you have satellites, they can be larger than the diameter of the Earth itself. And the picture I'm showing here is from something called the Event Horizon Telescope. Some of you may have heard there was a big publicity splash just, just recently because they managed to image at radio wavelengths the central black hole of the Milky Way galaxy. That's a connected array of telescopes that you see here, uh, all the way down to Antarctica, up to North America and Europe. Uh, most of the interferometers I'll talk about now don't have baselines this long. They'll have baselines of a few kilometers or a few tens of kilometers. But the principle is the same. You can use them to make very high resolution images of the nearby or the distant universe. So that brings us to ASCAP, the telescope. This is the Australian SK Pathfinder. And it was designed to be a new kind of telescope uh, designed and built here in Australia uh, by CSIRO in partnership with with a number of Australian universities and it's a 15 year journey to get to where we are now. That's typical for many of these big projects, it takes a long time, uh, but it, the payoff can be tremendous once we get there. So there were three new design concepts for this telescope that together make it completely unique. One, it was designed to have a very large field of view, which meant that it could do studies of the whole sky very quickly. Uh, second was that it would have a, have a wide frequency coverage, which allowed it to cover um, a large spectral band pass to, to be more versatile, and it was to be on a radio quiet site. And all of these also brought immense technical challenges, which is why the, the journey took 15 years. So to make a wide field of view, uh, the requirement was to, to develop new kinds of radio receivers and new technology that was achieved. And in fact, this receiver technology is now being used also to track multiple satellites at the same time in a, a, a company that's been spun off to do this commercially. Wide bandwidth, I think we've heard a little bit about this already. The data rates that come from this telescope are enormous. They're getting to be 10 or 20% of what we'll have with the SKA. So it's a genuine pathfinder in the sense of learning about 
uh, real data and it's a radio quiet site, um, which means it's a remote location, it's off the grid, there's no power, no services, etc. Um, I will skip over, over this fairly briefly, except to say that ASCAP is an array of 36 dishes, each 12 metres in diameter. Operating frequency that you can see there is 700 to 1800 megahertz. It's actually a telescope that's optimised to study neutral hydrogen. Field of view here, you can see the phased array feed on the left, which acts like a radio camera. Instead of a single image of the sky, it actually makes 36 different images at the same time. You can electronically form those to be any way you like on the sky. Generally, they're put in a square pattern that gives you a view that's around 30 square degrees of sky, which is enormous. Data flow, just shown schematically here, but to say that the, the data ingest, and I'll, I'll show a little movie in the moment that shows this perhaps more clearly, is around 2.3 gigabytes per second, uh, which means that the other end of the telescope is actually a supercomputer. Without the supercomputer, uh, to, to receive the data, the telescope couldn't continue to operate. So that's another first. That I think there's no other telescope that's quite so closely connected to big data and supercomputers. The reason for the remote site is to avoid terrestrial radio interference. Uh, and that's just shown here. We're looking at radio frequency spectrum from uh, 100 gigahertz to 1000 gigahertz here. At the top, you see, if you were to go out with a radio receiver in Sydney, you would see television transmissions, mobile phone towers, all kinds of things, completely drowning out most of cosmic signals that you might see in this part of the spectrum. If we go up to a, a regional town, Narrabri, New South Wales, um, things are a bit better, but you can see there's still a lot of transmissions there that will cause you endless trouble if you want to look at the distant universe. And at the bottom here, we see the Murchison Shire in Western Australia. Uh, the land area of the Murchison Shire is roughly equivalent to the land area of the Netherlands. The population is about 100 people. And there you see this band is now still quite pristine. So here's the site of the ASCAP telescopes. This is the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. It's also the site where the low frequency part of the SKA is being built right now. And as you see on the right, it's a radio quiet zone. So it's not only a pristine environment for radio astronomy at the moment, but there are regulations to keep it that way over the 50 year lifetime of the SK. And when we were talking before with the governor about the relationship between science and law, this is another example where I think lawyers have come to the help of scientists by providing the regulatory framework to keep this uh, as an excellent and pristine site for radio astronomy. There you see the radio quiet zone uh, extending out about 150 kilometers. Uh, and there are very strong regulations about what transmissions you can make and in what bands throughout that zone that will also keep things radio quiet for the SKA. So what I'd like to do now is to see if I can run a little movie that just give, gives you a fly through. Flying in here to Western Australia. Telescopes. Coming up to the landing coast of the boat. Oh, the great boat. Now you see the telescope. I'll give you an idea of the scale. And the whole array of antennas is about six kilometers. Here up at the five points of the telescope, you see the phased array feeds, the radio cameras, the five points. Now we're here with the telescope, and we're going to all the telescopes combined here. This one later. The data comes down on optical fiber, and then we're going to draw them. And then we're going to open the first, and they end up in the here at first, and the board. There, the process to make images of the sky, like I'm saying, actually. Okay, so that, that's as kept the telescope. Am I too loud now? Is that, that sound is still okay? Okay, great. So one reason for going to the radio quiet site, perhaps the main reason, in fact, is to observe this very faint spectral line uh, of neutral hydrogen. So 
if I just go ahead to the next slide, you will see that hydrogen is, is by far the most abundant element in the universe. So on the left here, you see the makeup of, of Earth and its crust. It's made up of, of what astronomers call metal, so things like oxygen, silicon, iron, and so on. If you'd ask what the chemical makeup of the universe as a whole is, it looks very different from the chemistry of the Earth. 73% hydrogen, 25% helium, um, one or 2% other stuff. So the universe that we live in is overwhelmingly a universe of hydrogen. Uh, and much of that hydrogen, particularly the hydrogen that can form new stars like this bright blue blob here, uh, that's all in its atomic form. And the only way to observe this directly is to use the single spectral line of neutral hydrogen, which is a spin flip transition at, at 21 centimeters. So you see the atom here, it's just a simple hydrogen atom of a proton and an electron. Once about every 10 to the seven or 10 to the eight years, not very often, um, one of those these elect electron will spin, will shift its spin and it will emit a photon at 1,420 megahertz. So the, for an individual atom, that doesn't happen very often. You have to wait a long time, but if you've got a large ensemble of atoms, then it's, it's happening somewhere all the time. And so that gives you a spectral line that you can see and you can make an image like the one that you see here in orange. So on the left is the optical galaxy. On the right is the distribution of neutral hydrogen. You can see that extends well beyond the optical galaxy. So if we want to observe the hydrogen line at larger distances, it gets redshifted to lower frequencies and takes us into the band where all this radio frequency interference is. So it's only at a radio quiet site like where ASCAP is that you can actually start to observe neutral hydrogen in distant galaxies. And to me, that's one of the most exciting features of this telescope. So here's a very early picture made with ASCAP of neutral hydrogen in the small Magellanic Cloud, which is a dwarf galaxy that actually is satellite, satellite orbiting our own Milky Way. It's about five degrees across on the sky, and you can see it from Australia on a, a summer night in particular. It's like a fuzzy blob. So this was already the, the highest resolution and most sensitive image made. You can see uh, the distribution of the gas here, and we can also see how the gas is actually moving around and how it relates to the stars. So I now want to run pretty quickly through three projects that have been carried out with ASCAP that illustrate three of the different modes of the telescope. So the simplest thing you can do with a radio telescope is to make something that's just a radio image of the sky. So you're integrating over the spectral domain and you're just look, measuring the total brightness. Um, from there, you can go to make a, spec a spectral line survey and then you can look at time varying. So the simplest thing is to make radio images of the sky. And this project RACS, the Rapid ASCAP Continuum Survey has done just that in the past year or so. The picture on the left, we have, and I'll come a little later to the Indigenous Land Use Agreement and the traditional owners of the land here. But one of the collaborations we have with the Wadjuri Yamaji people is that uh, we work with an artist collective there to commission paintings that represent the science done with the ASCAP telescope. So this picture by Margaret Whitehurst, a local Indigenous artist, actually represents her vision of racks the survey and the little white boomerangs here actually the telescopes looking up at the universe so the idea here was to make a new radio image of the whole sky that the telescope could see test out the processing software but also make what's called a sky model that we can use as a reference when we start to make deeper and deeper images of the sky so what you see on the left is uh, what a small part of this sky image looks like Every little dot that you see there most likely is a supermassive black hole in a galaxy far, far away that's accreting gas and is radiating extremely powerfully in the radio band. So this is really like a direct look into the very distant universe. And if we blow up on the right um, at the top here, the resolution depends on frequency. So the highest frequency band has the highest resolution. The two top images are from the RAC survey. The bottom one is the previous survey done by the US Very Large Array, um, the NVSS survey. And you can see that the resolution of RACs is, is much better and that the images go somewhat deeper. What's also interesting here is to do this NVSS survey at the bottom, it took over 200,000 separate images with the telescope. The US telescope had to be stitched together. It took them three years to, to make the observations. With ASCAP and the RAC survey, there were only 900 images that had to be stitched together to cover the whole sky, and the observations took not three years, but two weeks. 
So this is an enormous step forward in our ability to cover the sky rapidly. The reason why you might want to do this many times is that, as I'll come to later, there are transient radio sources that actually change and have very interesting properties. So it's not enough to do this once, you actually want to come back regularly uh, and do it again. So if you're interested, I'm sorry, my image has somehow come up sideways, which I didn't expect there. Um, I'll leave this on the online version of the tour. You can go online and you can actually play with the data. All the images are available for public download and, and study. So what's ASCAP doing now? We've finished a, a couple of years of test observations and the RAC survey. There are eight science surveys that are going to now carry out a five-year program. Uh, I'm just going to have time to talk about two of those, which I'm involved in. Um, but they cover a number of different science areas and these science teams have been working together now for more than a decade to get ready to do this work and to analyze the enormous amount of data that's going to be coming in torrents now from this telescope. So the first of these two largest surveys I'm going to talk about is FLASH. This is uh, an acronym for the first large absorption survey in H1. Uh, this is a project that I lead um, here at the University of Sydney with my co-PI Elizabeth Marnie, who you see second from the left there, who's at CSIRO. Uh, we have a small team here of, of students and postdocs working on the data, and we will continue to work on this for the next five years. But our goal is to provide the first systematic look at the neutral hydrogen content of individual galaxies in the distant universe looking back between four and seven billion years, when we know that galaxies were very different in nature what they are today. And we want to test the kinds of models and the large simulations of galaxy assembly and formation in this redshift range. So this is a different kind of survey. It's an H1 absorption line survey. And so what the basic principle here is you've got at the top, there's the Earth at the left. On the right, there is a distant galaxy with a supermassive black hole. There's gas accreting there and there's a powerful radio source. So we're observing with our telescope that radio source in the spectral dimension. So we're splitting out the radio signal by frequency. If at any point on its journey towards the Earth, that radio signal encounters a, a cold gas cloud, you see a little blip, uh, as you see in the red spectrum there. So here, about 1.28 uh, gigahertz, there is a, a dip. Uh, so the frequency of that dip tells you the distance of the galaxy the depth of the dip tells you how much hydrogen there is on the line of sight, what we call the column density. The advantage of doing things this way is that the sensitivity is independent of redshift. It only depends on the brightness of the thing at the back that you're using as a probe. That's very different from mapping in the emission line where things drop off as distance squared and you very, very quickly, even with a big telescope, run out of signal. So this is the only way really to look at neutral hydrogen in the distant universe. Um, if the signal is an intervening cloud, it tells you something about the cosmic changes in a neutral hydrogen content of galaxies. If the signal is actually in the galaxy where the radio source is, it tells you something about fueling process and feedback in supermassive black holes. So both are interesting. Just to give a rough idea how this works. So here we're seeing radio uh, spectral line image of a nearby spiral galaxy. At the top is what we see in H1 emission, the 21 centimeter line in emission. Because this is a nearby galaxy, we can do this. Um, and so of the three panels there, the one on the left is the total intensity of neutral hydrogen. The middle one is the velocity field. So we know in this case that the hydrogen is in a rotating disk. Actually, the velocity difference across the, uh, the rotation curve here gives you an estimate of the mass of the galaxy and if just rotation curves like this were the main way that dark matter was first discovered because the rotation curves required that there be extra mass in the outskirts of the galaxy and on the right we see essentially a measurement of the turbulence of the gas. The grayscale image is the optical galaxy and again you see the H1 emission extending far behind the long, beyond uh, the optical galaxy itself. And you may be able to see just a little red blip to the kind of just below the galaxy itself. That's a background radio source that we're going to use as the probe. And what you see on the right here is this is the signal that we see in H1 absorption. We just see a little dip in the outskirts of that galaxy. So as we move out into the distant universe, we lose all the information in that color picture there. We can't observe that anymore. The emission's too faint. But we still retain all the information that's in the bottom right plot 
Uh, and really then from that small amount of information, we want to reconstruct the information that's in the, the plots above that we can't see anymore. For one galaxy, that's hard to do, but if we have hundreds of them, then we can indeed start to reconstruct what these galaxies would look like if we could observe them H1 emission. I'll go pretty quickly over this because I want to leave time for my next topic, but we know that about 10 billion years ago, galaxies were forming new stars at something like 20 times the rate that they are now. The last 10 billion years of cosmic time are a ramping down of formation of new stars in galaxies. Our Milky Way galaxy is forming roughly one star like the sun every, every year somewhere in the galaxy. Uh, it would have been much higher in the past. We don't know why this decline happens, but we think it has something to do with the neutral hydrogen content of galaxies. And the plot on the right is to show the gray area is the epoch of cosmic time we're observing with ASCAP. We know almost nothing there at the moment about how much neutral hydrogen there is in the universe and how it's distributed in and around galaxies. So that's what we want to find out. The other nice thing about a radio array is that you don't have to wait to finish the whole array before you can start doing science. We actually started when we had five telescopes ready um, and we've continued on from there to carry out more and more studies. So this was our first discovery of an H1 absorption line in the distant universe. Um, you will see here, this is on the left what the data look like coming from the telescope. On the right, you see a blow up of this line, got quite complex velocity structure, which tells you there's something probably interesting going on here. Uh, and this, in the optical, you can see this galaxy is just a faint blip. It was so, so unknown that nobody had ever looked at it before, uh, but it's a very bright radio source. So this is actually detection of neutral hydrogen in a powerful radio galaxy at a look back time of 5 billion years. And to put that in context, 5 billion years ago, our sun and our solar system probably didn't even exist. The sun itself is only 5 billion years old. So these radio photons have been on their journey since the time of the formation of our solar system. Uh, and here you see my colleague James on the right giving a, we had a bit of a press release with this, giving an interview to a, a TV station in the UK. So we've gone on to discover a number of new lines. Uh, I'm only gonna show this very briefly but to say that we can now start to put numbers on a plot like this one, which shows the number density of H1 absorption systems as a function of cosmic time. Redshift is a way that astronomers use to measure distance. So the larger the redshift, the further away things are. What we've moved to doing in the last year or so is to look not just at single radio sources, but at every radio source in a single field of ASCAP at a time, that's about 200 sources. And we're starting to find many new lines like the one you see on the right here. So we're already starting to assemble samples of tens and dozens of these. We'd like to get up to about a thousand eventually. Uh, I don't know what's happened with that one there. Looked fine earlier, but you'll be able to, I'll, I'll post the slides if you need it. So just one last result from the flash survey. Um, here you see a couple of distant radio galaxies that have been actually well studied in an optical survey. We're seeing very strong H1 absorption systems, stronger than have ever been seen before against relatively faint radio sources. So these are again, places in the distant universe where there's a very dense concentration of gas um, there. So let me move on very quickly to a completely different survey. This is now looking at the time varying universe and these are phenomena known as fast radio bursts. And let me skip through these fairly quickly. These are results from another ASCAP survey called CRAFT. The PIs are Keith Bannister and Ryan Shannon for this survey. They, they piggyback on almost everything else that happens with the telescope. They bring their own instrument, they attach there. And you can see here the telescope on the front cover of Science. This was a, a paper that actually um, a number of us were involved in, led by Keith Bannister, that actually won a prize for being the uh, most impressive paper in Science for, for that year. Okay, so fast radio bursts are highly dispersed, short and bright single pulses of radio emission lasting a few milliseconds. And the plot here shows what this looks like. The first one was discovered in 2007, actually in data from the Parkes radio telescope. So time on the horizontal axis, frequency on the vertical axis. Um, what's happening here is something known as, as cosmic dispersion. So the radio wave is propagating through very diffuse gas in the space between galaxies and the 
uh, high frequency, higher frequency photons are slowed down less by uh, this material than the low. So the pulse arrives first at high frequencies and then it's later and later at low frequencies. Um, and you can actually calculate from the amount by which that pulse is dispersed, how many what electrons this, this uh, signal has passed through. And you can use that actually to work out the number of baryons that there are ionized baryons in the voids between galaxies. The fact that we see this amount of dispersion means that these are extragalactic. Uh, we don't know what causes these bursts, but they're interesting because they represent a new class of coherent radio emission. Uh, they're a bit like pulsars, but they're billions of times more luminous. They're somewhere out there in the universe. And as I just said, they're great probes of, um, of plasma between galaxies. Early challenges, for a decade after these were discovered, only a few more were found and they couldn't be localized. They were known, you could know roughly which area of sky they were coming from, but not enough to pin them down to a galaxy. And then in 2016, one of the bursts actually started to repeat, was found to repeat over and over again, actually many times. And that meant that it could be observed with, with radio interferometers, you know exactly where it was, and it could be located to a galaxy and it turned out this burst came from a fairly unusual, quite small galaxy, what we call a dwarf galaxy, um, with a lot of star formation, a lot of ionized gas. So people thought, wow, we've, we know this now, these fast radio bursts are to do with stars that have formed recently, some kind of phenomenon like a, a superluminous supernova that's linked to recent star formation. Then ASCAP comes into the picture, starting with a survey of um, just to find new bursts before the telescope itself was ready in its full mode. And within a few months of starting, they, they doubled the number of known bursts, making 20 detections, uh, working in a fly's eye mode. You can see some of them here, great diversity in, in the bursts. So we're looking at the, these have been de-dispersed and we're just looking at the radio spectrum of each of these. Uh, most of them fairly bright, but a really wide variety of spectral signatures and no repeat bursts. So there was only, for a long time, only one of these bursts had repeated. We still don't know if there are two different populations. A few other repeaters have been found now, about a dozen, but there are thousands of, of fast radio bursts that have now been catalogued, many from the CHIME telescope in Canada. Only a few percent of them repeat. We don't know whether there are two different classes or whether something else is changing with time. So very fast moving area of research. What I really want to focus on briefly is particular contribution of ASCAP, which is to pinpoint the location of the galaxies these bursts were coming from. Uh, and this is done in quite a clever way uh, in that you monitor the signal when you think you see the signature of a burst, you can actually say, right, take the last three or four seconds of data that the telescope has had, dump it in a buffer. Uh, then you can go back and make an image from that. So it's like as the data stream passes by, you capture it just at the right moment and make the image of the sky. And so this was the incredible thing that the team had done. Here's the first localization. Turned out this signal was 100% linearly polarized, which gives another clue for its possible origin. And it could be localized to within a fraction of an arc second precision. And here you see uh, the image of the galaxy. This tiny little black circle is in fact the precise position. So it's not in the center of the galaxy. It's further out in the galaxy. Also surprising, this galaxy looked completely different from the the other one that had been localized, which was the host of the repeating burst. So this is what we call a red and dead galaxy. Uh, this burst came from somewhere outside the center. There's no signs of recent star formation there. So this sort of opened up the field. The team have then gone on to find many, many more of these host galaxies. Here you some, some examples. The one at the top is actually observed by the Hubble Space Telescope, the optical image, but you can see that there's a great diversity of bursts. Uh, all of which have been localized. And we can start to talk about the kinds of galaxies now that these come from. Um, it seems like they hang around in galaxies that have some star formation, but they're not in the places where the star formation happened. Um, slightly puzzling. We can start to narrow down what sort of cosmic events might cause these bursts. There are many theories for the progenitors of fast radio bursts. And if you go to this link, FRB theory catalog, you can find there are many, there are cosmic strings, merging neutron stars, supernovae. Um, for a long time, there were actually more theories than there were bursts observed. Now I think that the bursts are probably winning. 
um, magnetized neutron stars, you know they have to be very compact. So to get a, a, a signal that's a few milliseconds in duration, you need to be originating from a region that's probably smaller than the Earth in, in size. Uh, we can start now by looking at the kinds of places in galaxies that these occur to start to rule out models, and that work is still very much ongoing. The next step is clearly to image more of these, uh, and ASCAP will uh, start its program this year of the five-year survey. I want to spend just five minutes, if I can, Alice, on the SKA. Yep, so this is an, an artist's impression of what the SK will look like. It's a composite of the South African site on the left, which is in the Karoo Desert, uh, and the Australian site on the right, which is in Murchison Shire, as we've seen. Mm -hmm. Five key science goals that drive the design of this telescope. One is galaxy evolution, cosmology, and dark energy. We've touched on that a little bit. One is strong field tests of gravity using pulsars and black holes. And the point here is that out in the universe, you can do physics, you can study the physics of extreme events, uh, much higher gravitational fields, much higher magnetic fields than you could ever create in a laboratory on Earth. Third is the origin and evolution of cosmic magnetism. We know that the sun has a magnetic field, the earth has a magnetic field, um, the galaxy that we live in has a magnetic field. We don't actually know where cosmic mag magnetism comes from and at what point in the history of the universe it originated. Um, cosmic dawn, which I'll come to in a moment, and the cradle of life is really looking for planets around other stars, complex organic molecules, uh, and so on. And the design is also uh, meant to be flexible to explore the unknown. Just a word or two about uh, cosmic dawn and epoch of reionization. This is a key science case for the low frequency SK telescope that will come to Australia. There's already active research groups in Australia working with the MWA radio telescope as a, a precursor to this. And the aim is to detect the radio signature of the first stars and the first galaxies that formed in the early universe. So theoretically, we know how to do this. You can see on the, the top left here an artist's impression of the universe as it emerges from the dark ages. The first stars light up and they ionize these little bubbles around them. We know what the signature ought to look like. The problem is that the signal from the epoch of reionization passes through the entire universe to get to us. And there's all kinds of distorting extragalactic foregrounds. So the challenge here is to keep beating down the systematic effects until you detect this signal. And we're probably still two or three orders of magnitude away from doing that. Um, it's not wildly different from what LIGO did with the detection of gravitational waves, where there was probably 20 years of work beating down the gravitational wave background to finally make, make the detection. Uh, and this will be the same. So very active and important area of research. SK project in numbers, I think I will just leave on the recorded talk, except to say there will be 130,000 SK antennas in Western Australia. Here you can see the partner countries for the project. Uh, the global headquarters is in the UK, the telescopes in uh, Australia and South Africa, many important partner, partner countries, including uh, China, India, Canada, many European countries. Timeline of the project should see the end of construction in 2029. That seems to be on track so far. And people actually doing science projects with the telescope by 2030. Just a couple of more things about the site to mention. One is I've mentioned already that the telescope site is on the land of the Wajiri Yamaji people. Uh, and an important part of building the SK was actually to have an indigenous land use agreement. We have one already in place for ASCAP. Uh, but progress has been made now this year on the indigenous land use arrangement for the agreement for the SKA. This is very important. Before any telescopes are built, there's a, a walk of the site with the elders of the Wadjuri looking for sites of cultural significance. And in some cases, we've actually moved the planned location of telescopes to protect those cultural sites. The last thing I'll talk about is the environmental footprint of the telescope. Um, Nowadays, I think all of us want to be sustainable in the way that we do our science. Uh, a telescope like this can chew up a huge amount of power. So a lot of work has gone into doing audits of all the CO2 use of the SKA. The main users are, in fact, the antenna arrays and the computing facilities. Um, there are others as well. So the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory has a solar power station. The telescope is designed to minimize consumption, but also has this huge array of solar panels enormous lithium batteries uh, in order to 
implement sustainable and affordable power generation. And this will be ramped up to, to accommodate the SKA. The Pawsey Supercomputing Center also has solar panels and they use groundwater cooling uh, to cool the supercomputer. So the idea is to make this as sustainable as possible and to be also a pathfinder for sustainable energy in remote regions. So I think that brings me to the end. I will just say I've left a few references at the end of my talk for further reading, but I think there's a great deal to look forward to and I, I welcome your questions and I envy the, those of you who are starting out in astronomy now because you will have a wonderful time ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sadler. That was a truly wonderful talk. I mean, what a way to start the International Science School and also to start our weekends for those of us who aren't joining you for the whole of this, this time period. Chris, um, I think uh, we might we might come up to you now, if that's okay online. We'd really like to warmly invite, before we break for some lunch and we let folks around the world head to bed or into their next sessions and have a break, we'd like to invite you to ask some questions to Professor Sadler after that wonderful talk. There were a couple of things that really struck me. I always love seeing Jodrell Bank. That's about half an hour from where my parents are at home. So it makes wow. me feel like I can sort of see a little bit of home. And also, um, I really like the way that you describe uh, a telescope as being like a time machine mm. to, to look back. We've already built time machines, you know? Um, but Chris, are there some questions popping up online? Oh, yes. I mean, there are so many questions online. So Elaine, strap yourself in. Um, let's let's start with with uh, with a couple of these questions, and then perhaps uh, Alice, we could we could go to to someone in the room. But the first one, um, I'm going to ask uh, some of these on behalf of the students, but I might call on some of the students to ask them themselves. But the first one I wanted to kick off with, because I think it's a really good one. Is there a reason? This is from from Earl. Uh, is there a reason why some telescopes are made as an array, while others are just a really big telescope? Is there a benefit? Are there advantages or disadvantages of having one or the other? Why do an array? That's a great question, Chris. Thank you. So indeed, we have both kinds of telescopes in Australia. We have the Parkes telescope like Droggle Bank. That's a single array. Uh, Chinese telescope is the same. Those are great for collecting a lot of radio signals. And if you've got something like a pulsar, which is incredibly compact, I mean, a typical neutron star is a few kilometers across, no matter how big you make your telescope, that's going to be hard to resolve. And so there's no advantage to going to an interferometer there. You just want to have something very simple that you can collect all the signal from your pulsar. So the Parkes radio telescope spends something like half its time looking at pulsars and transient events, and it's really optimized for that Chinese telescope the same. But if you're looking at radio galaxies, the Parkes telescope did an early survey of the radio sky, but it can't distinguish between radio galaxies that are close together and it can't measure structures so if you want better resolution than a few arc minutes which is what the parks telescope has you need to build an interferometer so an interferometer is for making images single dish is ready for collecting signals um, you can actually link them together you can put a single dish into the same array with your interferometer uh, and you've got extra collecting area and you can make an image with high resolution so um, I think we need we need both. Uh, the big dishes are also used for spacecraft tracking. So there's a 70 meter dish at Sydney Biller that spends all its time looking at uh, NASA spacecraft and the outer solar system. So it's it's still good to have both kinds. We're not sort of phasing one out and bringing another one in. They're different. That's they're different and they have different science cases. So indeed, if you want to look at something like epoch of reionization, which is key for SKA, then again, it, it's an advantage to have an interferometer. For the, for the next question, I might um, I might call on the question ask asker actually, Jaden. Jaden, are you out there? Do you want to turn your microphone and camera on? You had a question about very long baseline interferometer telescopes in space. Jaden, are you there? Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Wait, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, cool. Hi. Um, the in in the near future, would it be possible for like the telescope arrays, kind of like the EHT and stuff, would could that ever end up in space to get even higher resolution images of things like black holes? And yeah, things that's, like that's Lagrange points or something, or is it just question. too expensive? That, that, that has already happened to some extent. So uh, I was involved a few years back with a, a Japanese satellite that took a little uh, spike radio telescope into space and actually did VLBI from the ground. Um, there was also a Russian craft, Radio Astron, 
uh, that did something similar. They, they tend to go in very elliptic orbits, so you get a range of baselines there. Um, there is also a move to put radio telescopes on the moon, but yes, it's limited only by cost because of the difficulties of launching them. Uh, these telescopes tend to be fairly small in size that you launch into space. And actually, if you make the baselines too long, it turns out you almost run out of sources, you're resolving out the emissions. So uh, it's really only objects with a very high brightness temperature, very compact sources that you can start to see on these Earth to space baselines. So it's interesting, but it probably won't replace the ground arrays anytime soon. So okay. Jaden's Jaden's keen on not just launching the James Webb Space Telescope, Elaine. He wants a whole series of them spread out across yeah. the sky. Oh uh, yeah. So there are yeah there are certainly plans for ways that you could do this, and I think it would be very interesting. And the EHT are constrained to work at high frequencies because of scattering at the galactic centre. So indeed, putting an antenna in space there might might actually be quite interesting. Excellent. Cool. Look, third Thank question. You. Thanks, Jaden. Third question. Um, this is from Haruka Shibuya, who's one of our Japanese uh, students. And I'm, I'm going to ask this one myself because this one actually occurred to me a little while ago as well. What's between the galaxies, right? This is more of a general astronomy question, but I think you're probably qualified, Elaine. Is there stuff between the galaxies? You sort of think about stars and so on forming out, but what's between galaxies? And if there are stars there, are they different? Um. There are probably not many stars there. Stars can escape from galaxies. So if, for example, you have a binary star system and one of the stars becomes a supernova and explodes, um, the other star can actually just head off and exceed the escape, the escape velocity of the galaxy. You could lose it that way, so there are a few. What's mostly between the galaxies is very, very diffuse ionized plasma. Um, so if you think of the most perfect vacuum you could make in a lab on Earth, it's probably more of a vacuum than that. But space is a big place, and so the total amount of stuff in there is still a lot. In fact, something like half the baryons in the, the universe are probably in this intergalactic plasma. They're not actually in galaxies. Thank you very much. Alice, I might um, throw to a question from the room, if anyone's got one. Yeah, I would love to hear one from, from, from the room. And we have, we have a roving mic. Thank you, Caitlin. And um, would anyone like to ask one? Anybody over there? I can see a couple of hands. Well, I can see a person in a white shirt. Would you like to ask the question? Um, for any young scientists who are looking to get into astronomy or physics in general, do you have any things that you'd recommend in terms of paths that you'd look into that you wish you'd done when you were younger to help you accelerate yourself into your astrology or physics degree in general? Um, no, I don't think so. I think when I was a young student, I had very good advice. And the best advice I had was don't degree in astronomy, do a degree in physics and maths because you need that basic um, understanding of the principles of physics to apply that to astrophysics. Uh, I think nowadays, the other interesting thing is to find out whether you actually have an appetite for doing research. So a lot of people go into physics and they like to know what we've learned about the universe, but they might be quite uncomfortable about the things that we don't know. For me, the things that we don't know are actually the biggest attraction. And if, if you're like that, then probably a research pathway is, is the right way for you. And there are many opportunities now, even as a school student, to get involved in research online. There's some great citizen science projects in astronomy, like Galaxy Zoo, where you can actually go online in your spare time. You can be doing real research. It's a benefit, and uh, you can make discoveries. So I think that's something that's fantastic that wasn't available when I was younger. Uh, but otherwise, lots of opportunities to have internships, to work with um, scientists. Do research. If you come to Sydney University, you can do research projects from you know, first year and actually work with research scientists. So um, I think no particular advice other than if you enjoy it, then just look for, for ways to find out more. Do we have any other questions? Do we have any other questions from the room? We must have, I think we must have at least one more before we go online. We don't want online to be, to be beating us already. <laughs> one more? We have we have one one more, Chris, and then we'll come to you for the final question online, if that's okay. Okay. So not so science based, but just wondering how you went about finding the site for the SKA. Ah, oh, right. Yes. So there was a lot of site testing. So you actually go out and you measure the environment, the weather conditions, uh, and so on. So this was part of actually Australia bid to be a host country for the SKA, as did a number of other countries around the world. 
Uh, and part of preparing the bid was actually to investigate a number of sites. There were actually sites in New South Wales and South Australia that were looked at as well. I think one of the things that was also persuasive about the WA site, it turned out to be the best from a radio quietness point of view, but the state government very early on got on board and actually really helped to, to make that happen and built up in Perth a, a really excellent research institute now ICRA in radio astronomy that, that helps to attract scientists to the state. So uh, just a slow process of going out there and testing things and making the case. And eventually it was an international panel that said, yes, this is the place we want to put the low frequency half of the SKA. Before we go to Chris, I might say I'm happy to answer other questions from students by email or from even from uh, Discord, if you can find a way for me to get on there. So very happy to take questions offline if people still have them. That's fantastic. I mean, I think we definitely would like to get Professor Sadler on the Discord if we can. I think Chris might be able to help with that. Chris, can we go to you for one final question before we close uh, this opening session? Well, we certainly can, but two comments before we do. First of all, Elaine, careful what you wish for, because the Discord is an interesting place right now. And secondly, um, your comment before about um, doing a physics degree, that's what Harry always used to say. Harry always used to say to the students, if you want a Nobel Prize in physics, uh, in, in biology, do physics. You know, physics was what you should do. So this is good advice. Listen, for the, for the last question, um, I'd like to, uh, to see whether or not uh, hang on, I've lost it here. Where's it gone? Yes, Rachel Wakeling. Rachel, are you there? Do you want to ask your question about um, radio waves and, and black holes and gravity? Are you there? Do you want to ask that one? Yeah, hi. Um, <clears throat> it's so great to be here. Thank you. Um, so my question is, does the gravity of black holes like bend the radio waves around them and the light waves? So how do you actually, <clears throat> how do you actually like perceive like the pictures of the black holes when they bend all the electromagnetic waves around them would that change like how the radio waves and optical sorry how the optical and radio telescopes actually get the images um yes absolutely the black hole will distort radio waves optical emission in its near vicinity um if you look at the event horizon telescope images and and it's explained online i think far better than i can explain it now but you're actually seeing some of those gravitational distortion uh, effects in the radio image that you see there so it actually looks um it looks distorted by the gravitational field of the black hole that's looking very close in when we're looking at radio jets those only really kind of kick off quite some distance away from the black hole uh, and so by the time you get out there, you're not really affected in the same way by the black hole's gravitational field. So it's a very big effect, but it's really only important when you're you're really close to the black hole. But I, I've put at the end of my talks a couple of links to the Event Horizon Telescope public pages, and you could certainly find out a bit more there about um, what's going on. But all the times that um, Einstein's relativity has been tested in the strong field, um, gravitational mode, it, it seems to have come up and, and the observations match pretty well with what Einstein would have predicted, which is which is amazing. I hope that answers your question, Rachel. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Alice. Um, that does probably bring us to the end of our time, really. And uh, we have another session to go to in the not too distant future. So Alice, before I throw it back to you, just a quick message to the students listening online. Um, we do have our conversation with Derek Veritasi and Muller coming up, um, but we're going to push that back by a little bit. You can take about a half hour break for lunch, okay, and then come back to, to the next session. But Alice, back to you. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you for those great questions. I wish I was joining you for the whole of the ISS. Uh, if those questions are anything to go by, you can just see um, how much fun you're all going to have in the next little while together. Um, and we do hope that many of you come here to study physics or chemistry. I'll just whisper that one a little bit quietly. Um, or, you know, anything, um, anything, uh, any science, but any subjects that interest you. And I wish you a wonderful time on the ISS together with Chris. I'd also, of course, really like to thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sadler. That was a fantastic talk. Um, it's given me lots to think about, and I know yes. it has for the students. And now we will close the official proceedings for the opening. Um, and uh, as Chris said, uh, the ISS will continue in about 30 minutes. But for those of you who are here in person, please join us for some refreshments. For those of you online, have a fantastic time. Thank you. <laughs>